in this month, in the suttas that we have read, many different aspects of the teachings have come to light. They will only have benefit for us if we can first remember them and then practice them and then evaluate our practice. The Buddha spoke about 37 factors of enlightenment. They are factors which are present in all of us. They only become factors of enlightenment, of course, when we have perfected, cultivated and perfected them. All of these have been mentioned in the different suttas except four. The 37 factors of enlightenment are the Noble Eightfold Path, the Five Spiritual Faculties, which turn into Five Spiritual Powers when we have developed and cultivated them, the Four Supreme Efforts, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, Seven Factors of Enlightenment, and the four pathways to power. Now it's only the last one, the four pathways to power, which were not mentioned in any of the suttas that we have discussed and have not come to light. So I thought it would be important in order to round up our way to liberation by knowing those four also and also knowing that they are considered the essence of all the others. If a bhikkhu has entered upon those four pathways to power, he has found the way to liberation. If he has not entered upon those four pathways to power, then he has missed the way to liberation. In the Buddha's words. Now they're called Idi Pada. Pada is a path, P A D A path, and Idi is power. I D D H I. It's a very interesting word because in Sanskrit it's Siddhi. And the cities in India then and now are supernatural powers. It only means the word power, that's all that it means. But the word city is used in that way that it becomes known as levitation or um, knowing past lives and uh, such things. Now although the Buddha does mention such powers. They are not pathways to enlightenment. The word idi is the same as the word siddhi. These powers are powers over oneself. Now we have already many times recognized that self is a troublemaker, a continuous troublemaker. The more self, the more trouble. And Idi in the Buddha's description is, a, is gaining power over this troublesome self until it has been realized to be a delusion. We could just say it's wrong thinking just totally wrong thinking and because of that wrong thinking wrong feeling because thinking is also one of the six sense contacts and all sense contacts produce feeling so with the wrong thinking we have wrong feeling these four pathways to power are according to the Buddhist teaching 
of great importance and all four are co-joined with effort of will, willpower. Whatever comes to us, comes to us through willpower. And very often, that willpower has to be used in order to substitute the unwholesome with the wholesome, to suppress our desires and passions for pleasant sense contacts, and to put our effort into the restraining of them, avoiding them, not giving in to them, but instead to find our way to self-control. Effort of will, willpower, is indispensable on this pathway or any other. Even mundane living is totally dependent upon our willpower, what we do with ourselves. Even getting up in the morning needs willpower, even though it's not maybe needed to a great extent, some of it is needed. It is like a motor which we have to start ourselves and the more we let it run, the uh, more it will give us energy. So all four of our pathways to power have willpower with it. The first one is called concentration of intention. All four are concentration, four different concentrations. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all meditative subjects, but what it means is a coming together like a pulling together all the different aspects in ourselves so that we can bring it all to one point where it then becomes a power. If we have our thoughts dissipated in all different directions, <coughs> there's no power behind that at all. When we bring them together to one point, there can be a great deal of strength. Or if we have ten people all doing different things, each one is only dependent upon his or her own strength. They can do whatever is possible. But you get ten people together doing one and the same thing. It's more than ten times one. So what we need to know and to think about is that we must concentrate ourselves and to become one-pointed in our willpower and effort. Intention. It's our intention which gives us a path in life. What do we intend to do with ourselves? What are we here for as human beings? What do we intend to do with this life, which may last 60, 70 or 80 years? Some live even to 90, it's unusual. Some die at 30, that's also unusual. So what is our intention in life and how can we bring that intention to one point, make it so that we do not dissipate our energies. The concentration of this intention that we have with ourselves will make it powerful. Now if our intentions are quite in line with what other people do, then we will have to have 
material aspirations. If we want a spiritual life for ourselves and want to follow a spiritual path, then our aspirations will lie along those lines. It's not enough to know intellectually that the Buddha knows what he's talking about. At least it's an acknowledgement, but it's not enough by far. Any intention which can be powerful has to be the intention to emulate the Buddha, to be like the Buddha and his great disciples. Whether we make it or not is the second matter. But if there is any intention of a spiritual path, nothing is good enough except that. However well we can do that is not the criteria and it's not the question. The intention is, what are we doing? If I put bricks on top of each other and my intention is to build a house with these bricks, well, at least I know where I'm going with those bricks. Whether I finish the house or not depends on a lot of other circumstances. Maybe I don't even have enough money to buy sufficient bricks. Maybe I don't have enough strength to get the whole house finished. But at least I know what I've got in mind, I've got an intention. And this same intention has to be in our mind when it concerns our spiritual life. Do I want to build a complete spiritual aspect? Do I want to build enough within myself to transcend the human realm Am I interested enough to have that kind of intention? Whether I can do it or not depends on the energy, on the karma, on many other things. If this intention is clear-cut and one-pointed, it will prevent us from doing too many other things which dissipate our energy. The, um, everything we do, whether it is talking, thinking, driving, eating, digesting, excreting, writing, it doesn't matter what it is, all requires energy. If we have a clear-cut intention and a one-pointed way then all those things will be done for one purpose only, to transcend it all. At least we know what we're doing with ourselves. And also, because of that, we will find ways and means where such an intention will be supported. Now, there are many places in the world where such intentions of a spiritual sublimation are not supported. So obviously, we're not going to find ourselves there. We're going to find ourselves in such surroundings, environment and people that are of the same <coughs> idea, nature and direction. And because of that, our direction will become clearer and clearer. If I have an intention to go from here to Canberra, I have a direction. If I have this intention, I will be one-pointedly following it. If I should get sidetracked and go to Sydney, it's going to take me much, much longer to get to Canberra. It's got to be one-pointed, one way. And not only that, but if I should not know the way exactly and say, well, I do want to go to Canberra, somebody will undoubtedly help me to find it. But if I can't quite make up my mind where I want to go, it would be very difficult to find anybody that can say anything useful because I don't even know what to ask. Now, it may quite well be 
that one doesn't have the intention of the transcendence of the human realm well whatever the intention is that's got to be followed effort of will the willpower has to be like a motor which keeps this intention going it's very often the case that <coughs> the intention may be there but one judges the intention by its supposed success by its supposed results if we judge our actions constantly by their results we are first of all always having viewpoints we are always judgmental and hardly ever satisfied be difficult to be contented because there's only one pinnacle of satisfaction and contentment and that's the arahant fully enlightened and doesn't come about just by wanting it many factors have to play together to bring that about so if we constantly judge intention by what is the result of it we will lose our one pointedness because we'll undoubtedly find the results not totally satisfying it's only when we realize that our intention is correct and that we are not deviating from it but staying with it that we will do the action without constant judgment of the result judgment of result is always a dualism that besets the ordinary mind where there's always this dichotomy between good and bad tomorrow and yesterday you is in mind what i want and what i get but on this path if we really mean it that doesn't have any useful place in it the action has to be done the intention has to be kept and that's all the second pathway to power is a concentration of energy now it goes hand in hand obviously with the concentration of intention we use our energy for one thing only as long as we have a body this body needs attention but it can also that can also be kept at a minimum we don't have to go overboard on that and there are worldly matters that everybody needs to attend to obviously because we live in a complicated bureaucratic environment which demands certain responses that can be kept at a minimum if we are interested in keeping that at a, as a at a minimum it's quite possible it's not necessary to get into everything and be part of everything so if we know what our intention is we must be frugal with our energy and use it where it comes all of us have limitation of energy although meditation brings about renewed energy in the mind that too is not unlimited the energy which we have if it has behind it a one pointed attention it will be also a one pointed energy it is mostly mental energy what are we using it for what am i trying to do with my mind now all of us who have been meditating realize that although thinking at times is essential because otherwise mundane life 
cannot be accomplished, most of the time it's a nuisance. It's dukkha. It is painful because it's movement and therefore has irritation in it. All movement has irritation. It has friction. Movement and friction go together and because of friction there's irritation. Of course, as I said, there are necessary thought processes in order to keep mundane life going, but they too can be kept at a minimum. Our mental energy needs to be used for that which is most important. Partially, of course, meditation. But that in itself is not enough. Meditation is only the means. Our understanding of ourselves is where our mental energy is most usefully applied. The Buddha said, the whole of the universe, O monks, lies in this mind and body. One mind and body has the whole universe in it. If we understand this mind and body, which is our laboratory, which is, so to say, our working ground, we've always got it with us. We do not have to think about it. We need to recognize it. Recognize our inherent reaction. Reactions which very often are faulty because of the self-delusion. Now that self-delusion is constantly at work trying to throw a spanner in the works. A meditator, after some time of self-investigation, can become aware of that. How the, how the self-delusion throws the spanner in the works. And thereby recognize the not useful, the detrimental states of mind and content. Now here we touch upon the four foundations of mindfulness particularly the two last ones, number three and four, states of mind and content of mind. But that is not a thinking process. The difference between mindfulness of states of mind and thinking is one is producing states of mind and mind content and the other one is recognizing them. The production of them is totally unnecessary. The recognition is absolute essential. Since we are producing them anyway, here, there and everywhere, in our mundane activities and even in the meditation, we have enough to become aware of. Our mental energy, therefore, needs to be directed towards introspection. Introspection which is recognition and an understanding. It not, never should be connected to blame. There is nothing to blame. There's nobody there to be blamed. There are only mind states and mind content. That's all there is. And as soon as we change them to more exalted and purer states and content, there's nothing to praise. They're just mind states and mind content. And the purer they become and the more exalted they become, the easier life is. And the better we will understand the Buddha's teaching. The understanding of the Buddha's teaching is done with the heart. 
It is a very peculiar understanding. Naturally, we need to understand the words. We all speak the same language. So we understand the words. Very important. Buddha said, Dhamma should always be taught in one's own mother tongue. But why is that? Why in one's own mother tongue? Because that language that one learned at the knees of one's mother has not only words in it, it has feeling in it. Words have a feeling for us. When we hear the word love, each one has a different feeling about it. And some people have none, no feeling at all. It isn't the understanding of words that counts. Naturally, that comes first. If we don't understand what's being said, we are also in a great muddle. But it does not even have the same importance as the feeling behind it. So when we understand the Buddha's teachings from the heart, that is when we have used our mental energy enough for introspection to recognize what these words mean for us. In the Buddha's time, many people lay and ordained, became enlightened after hearing only one discourse by the Buddha. And we actually have the same discourse available to us. Highly unlikely that anybody would become enlightened now by either reading or hearing that same discourse. Why? The words don't do it. It's the strength that comes from, in that case, the enlightened mind which at the time of speaking also brings about a vibration which has to be received by the heart. Only then have we understood anything of the Buddha's teaching. Otherwise it remains a very interesting philosophy. It is. It is a very interesting philosophy. It's being taught in many universities. I myself have done so, teaching at university. It doesn't mean what the Buddha had in mind. Our concentration of energy has to go towards recognition. Recognition which means actual opening and seeing what happens within a human being. That's also a reason why the Buddha gave so much analysis, as you have heard during the time you were here, analyzing our different aspects, body and senses, and mind, putting it into different categories so that we no longer have the idea that there is just one thing happening, hearing or seeing or thinking, but that we recognize the fact how it all comes about. This kind of introspection then brings us to an opening, the opening of ourselves to something much greater than ourselves, much greater in a sense that it is all-encompassing, and when we can touch upon it, it has total purity in it. But as soon as there is a personality belief, the impurities start. They come at the same moment. The moment I am thinking, it's impure. When we are able to open ourselves to a universal aspect, to a totality, then the impurities are let go of for that time. 
And I'm not speaking now about meditative states. I'm talking about our everyday experience, particularly as it concerns our spiritual path and our um, connection to the Buddha's teaching. The next one of the four pathways is called the concentration of consciousness. Again, we have difficulty with the translation because the Pali word is chitta, which also means mind. So if we say concentration of mind or concentration of consciousness, it actually refers to the aspect of meditation which has the concentrated state in it so that we can let go of personal mind which are, of course, the higher jhanas. The concentration of our consciousness in another aspect needs to be carefully watched because wherever we concentrate, whatever we concentrate on, that's what we're going to do. Now, if we concentrate on cooking, that's what we're going to do, isn't it? it's impossible to build a house when we're concentrating on cooking and if we concentrate on our own personal affairs without reflecting in the mind on the universality of that which is within us namely that it happens like that everywhere that these are nothing but phenomena arising and ceasing. We do not concentrate our consciousness in that direction. We cannot follow the Buddha's teaching. We have to be careful what we do with consciousness, awareness, mind, mind moments. Where are we putting it? What is it actually now with intention behind us, the energy behind us, what is it actually where we are putting our most important conscious mental formations? Are we trying to distract ourselves from our dukkha? Why not? Most people do. Will it help us? or does Dukkha arise again? Are we trying to become more and more aware how Dukkha arises and by becoming more and more aware of how it arises knowing its remedy? Are we looking at ourselves dispassionately, objectively as nothing but a working ground on which samsara and nibbana the worldly life and the transcendence both exist depending entirely on where we put our consciousness in other words are we trying to make the worldly life as pleasant as we can or have we only one idea in mind and that is to find the way out of conditioned existence this applies to meditation the concentration of consciousness as I said in the beginning applies to the meditative states and this wanting to find the way out of conditioned existence applies to the meditation when the mind has become calm enough, concentrated enough, one-pointed enough to recognize that it can now look for unconditioned states. It may not know what the unconditioned state is like, but it has enough power, gained enough power through intention and energy and concentration to turn its back on that which is conditioned. 
Now that is using concentration of consciousness one-pointedly in one direction, meditatively. But since nobody meditates all day long, this has to be supported and also elaborated on in our daily experience. Where am I putting my mind? What is it that I'm carrying around in consciousness? Now this is extremely important for our well-being because if we carry around in consciousness that which is negative, that which is destructive, that which is um, defeating, then obviously that's how we're going to feel. There's no need to feel like that. It depends on what we carry around in consciousness. Are we aware of the fact that we have to protect our mind with its consciousness? Where does Nibbana arise? Obviously it arises in consciousness. So do we know that we need to protect that? Protect it from harm? Protect it from all ills that can befall it, who can protect our consciousness? Only we ourselves can do so. And if we haven't got enough willpower to protect ourselves, nobody will. There is nobody else in the whole wide world, anywhere, that can protect us from the negativity in consciousness. Obviously, everybody falls prey to that (coughs) once in a while. But if it becomes a state of affairs which is more often than not present, one should heed the danger signals. If it is a state of mind which is seldom present, we should recognize them and know that we can change them at will. It's nothing but effort of will. The protection which we need is the protection of that which is the content of the universe, consciousness, which is still conditioned, but that is the content of the universe, and all of us have part in it. If we cannot protect the little part that we have in that, our universe is going to look mighty bleak. The universe doesn't look, is not bleak, nor is the universe fantastic. The universe is, that's all. And consciousness is, and we've got part of it. Now because of the fact that we're not fully enlightened or half enlightened or anything enlightened, Mm -hmm. we need to have our consciousness directed in that direction where such a thing is possible so that all dukkha can finally be forgotten. Dukkha exists, dukkha is. But if the consciousness has been illuminated, then the dukkha that is, is not painful. It just is. And this is what consciousness will eventually understand. It just is. As long as we're trying to push it around, we're trying to push the world around, we're trying to push ourselves around, we'd like to do this and we wouldn't like to do the other. We'd like to have this, we wouldn't like to have the other. We'd like to have this person do that or we'd like to have another person do something else. Or we'd like to have people more understanding, kinder, more loving, attentive, praising, and all the rest of it. As long as we're trying to push the world around, we've got nothing but dukkha. We can't push it around. How can we ever have such delusions of grandeur that one little person with one little aspect of consciousness could push the world around? However, 
when we no longer have personal consciousness, but their only consciousness that there is, is universal, the world changes immediately. From two aspects. There were four things that the Buddha wouldn't answer. One was the beginning of the universe, one was the intricacies of karma, one is the influence of a person in jhana, and one is the influence of a Buddha. When there is nothing but universality in consciousness, the world changes. Why? Because at that time, one human being has attained to that state and no longer stays in the personal. And because of the makeup of the world, which consists of all these different human beings, it has changed because that one consciousness has changed from the personal to the universal and maybe beyond to the unconditioned. And it has changed because a person who has that kind of consciousness sees the world in a totally different light. It looks entirely different. It doesn't have that aspect of impingement, resistance, delineation, limitation. It's wide and complete. Now all of that can denote universality of consciousness, but it can also denote the unconditioned consciousness. The consciousness, sorry, the consciousness of the unconditioned. Either way, the world has changed. But as long as we try to push it around, this world, we're going to have lots and lots of dukkha. It just won't be pushed around. Because in reality, all that we see is a projection of our own mind state. We can see whatever our mind can throw up. It's like a movie projector. It depends entirely what reel we've put in. We can put any reel in and it runs and runs and runs. And the last of the four is a concentration of investigation, which in one aspect is insight, whereas the concentration of consciousness is calm, samatha and vipassana. Investigation. The investigation in the terminology of the Buddha always means the investigation into the three characteristics of all that exists. Anicca Dukkha Nat, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and corelessness, substancelessness. Investigating all phenomena. Now this concentration of investigation means that we don't forget, that we keep on doing it, no matter when and how. It doesn't matter whether we are walking through a forest or whether we are talking about uh, some matters of mundane importance, we remember it's all impermanent. It's all unsatisfactory. It not, nothing had quite core substance. And if we don't forget those three, nothing will really bring us great importance. Nothing will be of such impact, nothing in the world will be of such impact that we get to clinging to it. Our clinging to the worldly things is arising because of the fact that we forget to investigate into those three characteristics. Now if we should once only do it for a whole day and not forget the whole day to see those three, one of the three, or all three, it doesn't matter, in everything that is happening, mind states, mind content, material things, connections, reactions, whatever may happen, 
only one day the world changes for us we get a different view just one day obviously concentration of investigation means that we keep on doing it but having done it one day we can do it for two or three because the mind can be habitually trained these are factors that we have known for a long long time through our scientists that our minds are habitually responding and because they're habitually responding we have to develop good habits if we don't develop the right habits but stay within the old habits if we stay with these habits then our pathway is blocked because habits are habits and they are deeply ingrained and are strongly performing for us so we need to look at our habitual responses to that which is happening around us to that which is happening within us if we can't see the habit in it then we haven't opened up to the newness of the spiritual path the spiritual path may sound all right but it's got to have an opening and the opening can only be when we see ourselves a little more clearly the investigation which is our path to insight needs to be a steady progression in the beginning we may just look at impermanence because it is by far the easiest one to see if we are just willing but it's not an intellectual acceptance if it is an intellectual acceptance it doesn't do us any good at all impermanence can hardly be debated or denied so it's not difficult to accept it intellectually but we've got to feel it we've got to feel the impermanence within every mind state disappears every emotion disappears every sensation disappears every day disappears every night disappears every contact disappears every conversation disappears there's nothing that stays around if our meditation hasn't come together yet that might seem frightful so matter of fact it's the only solace we have imagine if everything were stuck together and stayed the way it is that'd be absolutely dreadful we wouldn't have any way out we'd be stuck in our dukkha it's all constantly moving and we've got to feel that movement when we start feeling this movement there's a shift in consciousness the shift in consciousness removes the clinging to what is trying to keep it that way trying to push it around so that it becomes the way it should be and just flowing with whatever is happening if we don't forget we start to feel impermanence once we have remembered to look at it to look at everything in that way we may actually look at the dukkha aspect dukkha is not the tragedies that befall us or the awful mind states which arise or the terrible things which happened to us years ago or which we are afraid of might happen to us in times to come 
That's not Dukkha. Dukkha is the inherent dissatisfaction which arises out of the fact that there's nothing we can hang on to. That inherent dissatisfaction within each human being has to be seen with one's inner vision and only then are we convinced that we need to get beyond conditioned existence. As long as we think we've got personal dukkha because somebody did something, somebody said something, somebody didn't say something, we didn't say something, we didn't do something, all these totally innocuous reasons why we should be having dukkha, as long as we think that any of that is true, we'd never want to get beyond conditioned existence. All we want to do is make things a little more pleasant for ourselves. And once we have actually remembered to look at the dukkha which is inherent in all that exists, then together with the impermanence we may recognize that the core substance which we call self or the core substance which we call tree is nothing but a mind-made illusion. We've made it up for one reason only, because we'd like to find something which is solid. We'd like to find something which is permanent. We'd like to find something that we could hang on to, that we could say, aha, this is mine. I'm going to keep this one. This is all right. That's why we made up the self-illusion. And that's why we have named everything. We have to put things into categories. Otherwise, we don't feel safe and secure. We need to see that this safety and security in names and forms is nothing but a complete delusion because all that that we want to hang on to changes continually. And then when we have remembered To investigate like that, it will change our complete outlook. It will change our being. We won't feel solid and identifiable. We will feel transparent and in a symbolic way, obviously. I don't mean that the body becomes transparent. And we will feel that that what we've been clinging to was nothing but water. It wasn't a life raft at all. But that what we now see is security and safety because it rests on absolute truth and not on relative truth. with that investigation into phenomena which is also the second step of the seven factors of enlightenment what is added here is the concentration of it (coughs) again and again over and over until it becomes habitual until it is a habit of introspection which no longer feels difficult or objectionable but brings with it a feeling of freedom of lightness, of buoyancy it's all changeable it's constantly moving and there's no satisfaction in it and there's no substance in it can you feel that when there's no substance in it that nothing can hurt you it's the substance that's being hurt nothing else dukkha disappears when the one who's having it has disappeared there are deeds but no doer there's suffering but no sufferer there's a path but no one to enter there's nibbana but no one to attain it as the words of the Buddha When we use these 
pathways to power with the effort of will with our full understanding where our concentration should be we cannot fail it's impossible that the mind which is one pointedly directed towards liberation should not get liberated if we are one pointedly directed at anything that's what we'll do if we are one pointedly directed at our sense contacts or at materiality if our wishes are strongly one pointed that's what's going to happen if we are one pointedly directed towards freedom that's where we'll wind up in complete freedom it's a matter of concentration that too becomes better as every meditator knows it can't help if one keeps on doing it the mind which used to wander a lot starts wandering less and then it can actually be controlled the mind which is controlled is a mind that can be liberated if we allow our mind to do what it pleases it's going to be in every state that is possible to a mind proliferation papancha the mind wants to explore it all and has already explored it all the buddha said we've done it all many times over aren't we tired of it yet we've done the same thing life after life getting born learning to walk and to talk learning to go to the toilet learning to read and to write fighting with siblings fighting with peers getting older getting a job learning to have a job getting a job having children letting them go through the same miseries having grandchildren dying and starting all over again and in that time we have eaten tasted smelled seen heard touched and thought everything that's possible to do with those senses we've probably all been in all the different realms if we haven't got tired of it yet we haven't paid attention having done it so many times that's why we're doing it rather well most of us don't find it very difficult to just do the ordinary human life it's become a habit but to get out of that habit that's what the teaching is all about so if we direct our intention energy consciousness and investigation in the direction of freedom and liberation that's where we'll be if we direct it <coughs> towards personal gain of any manner or form doesn't have to be material any personal gain that's what we'll get it depends entirely what we want to do every human being has the potential for freedom for liberation for enlightenment the buddha taught ordinary human beings like ourselves some of course didn't listen too well I said that once before it may have been us so we're here again and we'll try again the not listening too well is the crux of the matter it's not the ears that need to listen it's the heart and if we do that we can't fail these four were the missing 
factors of enlightenment of the 37 which the others had been elaborated upon and they are as you can probably tell of the essence for the path and as we are committed and if we are committed to a path which transcends human foibles we will have the opportunity to use them more and more and with that there will be more and more satisfaction in the mind because it leaves behind the very small minded and limited personality affairs and reaches out towards something which is far beyond the everyday consciousness and with that we will find more and more satisfaction within I won't touch upon anything now as far as our practice goes when we leave here I'll talk about that tomorrow tomorrow morning and uh, maybe you have some questions about this or anything else that has been said That's fine. I would like an hour, please, if you could repeat what you said. Um, oh dear. Something like, um, if the heart is telling you one thing, and yet the mind is thinking, logical thoughts seem to be saying something else, did you say to us, follow the heart? Well, I don't know what I said, to tell you the truth, <laughs> because I can't remember from one minute to the next. <laughs> but if you have a pure connection to that what you feel, then you can most likely rely upon that. But if it, can, it concerns feelings which are directed towards having it easier, more pleasant, more comfortable, you can't rely on that. So, it depends on how, what the feeling connection is, where the connection is. See, if the connection is to the senses, you cannot rely on it. And with that goes the thinking also. So there must have been something else in that statement to, um, you know, elaborate upon it or make it more detailed. You said you didn't like to use the word intuition, but you said in your own life. Oh, yes. You I I'm more and more clear. All right. Yes, okay. Now, that would give the clue with the intuition. Um, there is a a way of not being connected to your wish for pleasant sense contact which includes thinking but there is a possibility for a meditator to be in a state of mind which is pure enough to have a, um, an understanding of what is what needs to be done and that can be followed rather than trying to figure out whether that is logical, that that really is the thing that is most um, opportune or anything like that. But then 
it's very much disconnected from any wish for pleasant, for essential gratification. It's got to be totally disconnected from that. Is that clear? Okay. Yes, I, I'm not sure whether the word intuition is uh, a, a satisfactory one and I, I always shy away from it but uh, try to explain it like that. Anything else? Yes? You um, mentioned uh, universal experience about the unconditioned and um, I'm wondering to differentiate um. yes uh, that's uh, uh, quite an important point the um, <coughs> universal mind or infinity of mind or infinity of space which are uh, jhanic experiences but can also be um, for a meditator experiences in daily life if the mind is going in that direction um, are certainly uh, far more encompassing than personal mind and personal uh, experience but they're still conditioned they are, they are the, their condition is their existence is their condition and to us to to um, touch upon them the condition is concentration but the unconditioned goes beyond universality of mind or infinity of mind and infinity of space and it goes to the uh, complete letting go of all of that space, mind, in the consciousness all of it it goes into nothing in, well, yes, into the the primordial emptiness if you like it's very difficult to find the word that uh, fits to for everyone um, one really makes up one's own words in that respect hmm? different from corelessness or the uh, it, the, the corelessness the, un, the, the recognition of corelessness is the the trigger for the reaching of the mind that lets itself be within that emptiness. It is also corelessness, yes, certainly, but the understanding or the, the recognition of corelessness is the trigger that brings the mind into that state of emptiness, of, of primordial emptiness. So that's beyond universality of mind. It's still not oh, yes the unconditioned primordial emptiness which are words which I've made up which whether they're satisfactory or not I'm not sure um, that is the, the uh, enlightened state and which happens you know successively so the, that's why the differentiation between the jhanic states and that needs to be um, you know difference, there has to be differentiation between those two the uh, or the in, infinity of mind is a jhanic state can also be in daily life at times when there's no need to be personal <laughs> personally identifiable I mean there are states in, even in our daily lives when we don't have to be personally identifiable I mean there's nothing happening so it is possible then to go back into that but it's still conditioned the unconditioned is one step beyond letting go all that is that clear? Okay. Hmm. Anything else? Well, <coughs> what happens when um, in those states of mind you can be in a in a jhanic state of concentration and and if you then experience say a Davic realm what's the difference between that state of mind and, and losing it and going into a sort of a, a universal experience which is, is not is not within the jhana but it's, it's sort of on another state of 
consciousness. Yes, I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the jhanas are the vehicles for uh, the lower jhanas for the lower deva realms and the higher jhanas for the highest deva realms. So it's not difficult to um, uh, have a jhanic uh, experience in meditation and then be um, going to that experience of what the deva realm appears to be at that time. It's not advisable. The mind should be taken away from it and put back into the jhanas. Because you see, what can happen is when Ken becomes very attached to the Deva realm consciousness and that's all one wants then. One would like to go there and live there happily ever after. And because the higher Deva realms have such enormous lifespans, it is as if one is happily living ever after. And uh, the clinging to that, the Buddha was very adamant about it, that it was also not useful because it's also impermanent and one needs to have the way to liberation. So if that happens in the jhanas, uh, it is advisable to get the mind out again, back into the jhanic state of the infinity of consciousness or infinity of space or whichever it may have been, and l- let the mind stay with that. And as one comes out of the jhana, then recognizing that that too was impermanent, the jhana state was also impermanent, and that within that moment of, of moments of being in it, there was no personal identity in it. And that's then the two most important insights of impermanence and non-self, which give, no, they are not enlightenment experiences, but they certainly prepare the mind to want to go in that direction. But if one allows the mind to go to the, well, once in a while it might can have a little holiday in the Deva realm, why not? But uh, we don't want the mind to go on holiday all the time. We'd like it to do its work, right? But does, that, does that mean when that occurs that, that it's like a, a little slip in concentration? Just yes. The, the, the real uh, intensification of concentration of the jhana sort of dissipates a little bit, which allows that to happen, and you yes. have to regather the concentration. Yes, that's right. Yes. It's a quite a natural thing to do because we do want our sensual gratification until we are full, ar- full arahants. And it's very nice in the Deva realm. You know, everything is great, you know. So the mind likes to have a little, as I say, have a little holiday. So we bring it back together one pointedly. And because it's very, very dangerous to do it too often, it becomes an attachment. One can get very attached to that sort of thing. And it appears to be such a um, nice thing to be attached to, much better than our growth thing that we know from the human realm. Anything else? All right, we know the pathway to liberation, so all we have to do is please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. See yourself as a person which you know intimately. I 
I now love this person which you know so well with all its faults and all its good features love this person wholeheartedly Now pick out a person from those who are here present and now love that person wholeheartedly. Without discriminating between that which you like or don't like. Now put your attention on everyone who is present here and love everyone wholeheartedly, equally, caringly, with everything that your heart can give. Now think of those people whom you know intimately and now love these people wholeheartedly with all their faults and all their good qualities without discrimination just loving Now think of all the people you know. Maybe just meeting them here and there. And give them a wholehearted love. Everything that your heart can give.
Now think of anyone whom you know quite well and who you think has more faults than lovable quality. Drop the idea of the fault and love that person equally well. And now let the love flow from your heart as it will to people near and further and further away touching their hearts giving them all that your heart contains of love and compassion Open the heart ever wider, letting it, the love flow unimpeded, like a golden stream. Let it flow to all beings on this globe, whatever kind they may be. And further and further into the universe, touching beings everywhere. Imagine that your love fills the whole universe so that nothing that exists in it is exempt from it. And now come back to the one person whom you know as me. And let this one person be part of the universe, its beings and the love that covers all of them.
male beings have love in their heart. 